You will treat all Marines with the highest level of respect, for we have earned our place as Marines and will accept nothing less than that from you! This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I must master my life. Without me, my rifle is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Jarhead Podcast Season 2. This is going to be a great show. We're looking forward to having a couple guests on. First time we've had multiple guests on. We're really looking forward to this conversation. I know you guys will as well. Before we get going with the conversation and bring our guests in, there's a couple of things we do want to talk about. Uh, if you're out there and you're a veteran, really anyone, but especially if you're a veteran and you're in that hole, you're in the darkness and you're looking for the light, call me, text me, email me 24-7. I can't give you medical advice, but I might be a pretty decent ear to listen to. If you are looking for someone to get you into some medical attention and all that, remember two things. One, you are definitely not alone in this world. you got a lot of brothers and sisters out here that are willing and able to help you in any way possible. And two, the world is a much better place with you in it. So please, I implore, utilize the Veteran Crisis Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. Once again, 1-800-273-8255, or on your cell phone, just dial 988. We are spotlighting, as always, the United States Marine Corps in this podcast. If you have any questions on what it takes to earn the title United States Marine, see the website marines.com. That being said, guys, we've got a couple guests we're going to bring in that are, uh, one, they're, they're heroes, whether or not they want to admit it or not, and what they have done with this book is going to make them even more of a hero we have um, a couple CIA officers, and one of them is a former Marine, and one is still a current DOD employee, but they are both at the time working uh, in the CIA aspect during the Benghazi attacks of 2012, 10 years ago. I know it's, it's kind of strange to think about 10 years ago, but it's been 10 years and, and all of that. But uh, we've got Dave Boone Benton and Sarah Adams to join us. And when you guys are watching this, if you're watching this podcast on video, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube and all that, and you like it, Obviously, go ahead and try to subscribe or follow us, but share this. This is going to be a story that we want you to share out there as much as you can. Um, this is going to be some untold. This, this book is going to contain a lot of untold information previously that most people haven't heard or at least haven't paid attention to. If you're listening to this in the podcast world, then obviously, if you want to follow the podcast, great. Once again, share this podcast because I think this is a story that people are going to want to see. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. We've got uh, Dave Boone Benton and Sarah Adams joining us. And guys, thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be a conversation that um, I'm excited to have, but I know that you guys have a book and it's been a long time coming and it's been 10 years, 10 years, almost to, you know, within a couple months now. Uh, 10 years since the craziness in, in Benghazi, Libya. Uh, Boone, Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Absolutely. It's my honor to have you guys. And and I know that we'll get into the book and we'll get into uh, maybe some stuff about after uh, military and, and service life, whether it's CI, DID, whatever it is. I know there's a lot of people up there that are getting ready to transition out from um, from their service and may not have a clue of what's out there or what they have to offer, which I think is a shame because you guys have a lot to offer. But uh, we're going to talk a little about that. But first, before we dive in, we'd like to have a little bit of fun. Uh, I want to ask this to both of you, but uh, Sarah, we'll start with you. Uh, what was the first car? Do you remember your first car? It was a Chevy. Nice, nice. Uh, Boone, do you remember uh, your first car? Absolutely. Toyota Camry. I bet you it still runs. If, if, you, if you could find it, I bet you it's still running. Those Camrys don't ever go away. Um, Boone, I want to start with you. In your time in the Marine Corps, do you have a worst least favorite or worst MRA that you ever had? A worst? Yeah, um, what was the least favorite MRA you ever like? When you almost just you, you refused to eat if you ever got it again. Always gave away the, the ham. Yeah. <laughs> the ham slice. Oh. The ham slice. We had it we had a guy who loved it. So every time we got it, he would trade. 
it was wonderful. Like, hey, you can have a ham slice. The ham slice was terrible. Uh, Sarah, throughout your travels, I'm sure you've been some weird places. Is there a, a, a somewhere of a food that you had that just changed your life in a bad way or good way? Either way. Pretty much everything in the country of Germany, <laughs> besides their desserts, like labor case, like I don't know, everything that they make, you're like, oh, where's the Italian restaurant? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They use a lot of, I think they use a lot of vinegar and stuff over there, and it's like, yeah, I, I there are some. What is that? Um, I don't remember what it's called. It's a German dish. There's one thing that I, I don't mind, but everything is just too like vinegary for me. But yeah, give me some Italian food. I'm in with that. Uh, let's do this one. Um, if you could, Sarah, I'll go with you first. If you could play out any superhero, like who's your favorite superhero out there? If you could, if you could be one, like who would be the one you'd want to be? So he's not a superhero, but my like celebrity crush is Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. <laughs> it's Buzz Lightyear. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> Do you have Boone? Do you have a a superhero or someone that you said there? Man, that'd be cool to be that person for a day or something. Yeah, I do. Um, and it kind of switched when I was younger. It was the Hulk, but more recently, okay, yeah. it's Iron Man. Heck, you go over with Iron Man. Yeah, there. If there was one person that I'd probably change with, I've always said I wanted to be Han Solo because you could be a complete smartass. No one expected anything from you, and you got the girl. That's a pretty good life. And you got a Wookiee as a best friend. That's like kind of a pretty cool life right there. So Han Solo would be a pretty cool person to be for it. Well, be for a day or whatever. And our last one, now this one, guys, I'm not going to lie to you. This one brings up a lot, of, a, a lot of heat. A lot of people will comment on this. It's our most controversial question we ever ask. We, we, do, we do bring the hard questions. And let you both answer this. Is a hot dog a sandwich? I think a hot dog is like the worst food in America, so you're gonna have to ask him. No. <laughs> See, I knew I knew you had the right answer. People think that hot dogs are sandwiches. I said hot dogs and burgers are on the menu on their own little special island out there. They're not. They're not sandwiches. It's a lot of people that think they are, and a lot of people think that Slim Jims are candy bars. Just because it's in the candy aisle doesn't make it candy. So it is what it is. Uh, we always like to have fun with those little pop-up questions, kind of get the fl blood flowing. Guys, I want to take just a minute to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart. A couple friends of mine are a part of what they call the MARSOC 3, who were falsely accused and falsely charged with the death of a contractor back in 2019. This has been going on for three years, and they're dragging them, their families, and their friends through absolute hell. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever to say anything but self-defense. If you haven't heard of the MARSOC 3, just Google it, and you can find all, all the information you want. What I'm asking you to do is to help, help, help help these guys with their legal defense costs. It's gonna cost a lot of money for these guys to fight for their lives, and I'm asking you to join me in helping them support this cause. All you gotta do is go to this website and donate what you can, whether it's a dollar, a hundred dollars, whatever you have, every dollar helps. So if the words Semper Fidelis mean anything to any of you out there, please, please, please join me in this fight. Let's free the three. Um, but let's kind of jump in right into Benghazi, Know Thy Enemy. And this is a book that you guys have been working on for a long time, whether it's getting it cleared through different organizations or whatever, writing it and all of that. I'm going to let both of you guys kind of give your, your, your take on this. But where did the concept, obviously I know what the concept is, but where was the concept of why this book was important for both of you to get out? Well, um, it stemmed from a lot of things that we saw were not being done. Um, our government failed to act both on the intelligence side and on the law enforcement side with the FBI. So we, we took it upon ourselves, you know, to do our own investigation and to make sure that, you know, justice was really served because it wasn't being done. Yeah. And, you know, even when we talk about justice, right, you know, FBI detained a mastermind and actually Boone, um, refused to testify against him because he didn't believe he was a mastermind. And that's kind of one of those key turning points. There's a few of them, but it was like, hey, we don't believe he's a mastermind. No one's going to go find the mastermind. We're kind of the only two who, who will go do it. And so that was a big turning point for us, too, that we wanted real justice. Now, do you guys think that the mastermind that they had um, was 
out of, hey, this is a scapegoat. We can end this, or they were too lazy, or was a combination of a lot of things, or why do you think this particular individual was the mastermind that they thought? So there's, sorry, there's two things. One is the fact that um, he was an easy catch. He was ve- he's a very simple-minded individual. Um, another thing is, is that they didn't really want to pick up the real mastermind because he's Al-Qaeda, so that would obviously go against the narrative. I'm sorry, you had something else? No, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, so he was just an easy capture. Basically, after the attacks, um, he went back to work. He was working on his site every day. He was a home builder. Um, you could just drive by and see him working. We could do it all the time. So he wasn't someone in hiding. He was a really easy capture. And I, the funny thing is, is the terrorists in Libya refer to him as a scapegoat. So when you use that word, that's why we both laugh right. because that's their nickname for him in Libya. It's interesting too, because that was one of the turning points for me um, is when, you know, the FBI wanted me to testify, you know, against Katala. And I asked them a few questions that they couldn't answer. Um, and, and they knew they couldn't answer him. And it's like, look, guys, you really don't have a case. And this is not the mastermind. So I actually refused to testify. Um, and, and with that, if you think about it, if you were the mastermind and you committed one of the largest attacks on a U.S. facility since 9-11, um, would you just go back to work and not hide? You know, you'll see in our book where a lot of the terrorists who were Al-Qaeda actually fled to Syria. You know, so if you were the mastermind, why would you just hang out and go back to your nine to five day job every day? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, and also really interestingly, we actually have two masterminds in the attack. We can get into it. But anyway, the one who shot those mortars um, at the CAA, Mm -hmm. that's our two officers, he, after the fact, became basically the Al-Qaeda hero of Benghazi, right? He became the key commander of all Al-Qaeda fighters. That's what happens to successful masterminds when they take it to the U.S. Um, So, yeah, um, unfortunately, they just wanted to check a box, and that's what they did. And the the public was okay with it, which, which is very frustrating. So there's going to be some ignorance on my part and, and, and a lot of ignorance probably from a lot of people watching or listening to this because uh, the details that y'all are going to talk about, my mind directly goes to 13 hours. And so you try to have to pick out this and say, well, I don't remember that in the movie. So that's just kind of cool. Maybe fill in some of this stuff. Um, one of the people, the four people that were killed in the attacks was Ambassador Chris Stevens. And everything that I read about this guy was he was a like a real dude. Like and he was one of those people that people believed in. And I think that the Libyans actually enjoyed him. Uh, can you guys, I know he doesn't get talked about enough through all of this. Can you guys talk about your dealings with Chris and, and kind of something you remember about him that was kind of special? Yeah, so... The thing with Chris Stevens, I mean, the really cool thing, he was a career diplomat, right? He had worked across North Africa. Um, He wasn't like some appointee and they just put him there and he was in the State Department for two years. So he was loved within the State Department. The other thing he was really good at is that kind of expeditionary diplomacy, which is what CIA does a lot of, but State Department's usually risk averse and they don't do that. But he was the guy who did it. And so he had a lot of respect within the CIA, within the DOD community. Um, Just the fact that he would go out, take those risks. He understood it was important to be in those places, even as a diplomat, right? Um, It was important for him to be there as well um, for the presence. Um, And as most people know, he was a special envoy who led all of our efforts during the revolution. So yeah, he was loved by the the, the residents of Benghazi because he basically saved their city. That's the way they viewed him. Um, And like I said, within our community, he was just he was very well respected. Did you have anything? To add? Absolutely. And something that people don't realize or they take it out of context. Um, there, there's a famous picture, unfortunately, when they they bring um, Ambassador Stevens' body out of um, the burning building. And they say Allah Akbar. And a lot of people think that they're celebrating his death. But what they don't realize is that these are actually supporters of Ambassador right. Stevens. And they were rejoicing that they recovered him. They thought he was actually alive, which he wasn't. So oh, okay. Okay. Effect of most of the Libyan people. Yeah, and that always makes us feel good. He was saved by the people who actually cared about him in Benghazi. Um, you know, unfortunately, he had already passed away, but at least they're the ones who found him, transferred him to the hospital, and then we were able to take him home. So, you know, that that was a very positive after the end of such a horrible evening. Yeah, I, I can only imagine what would have happened to the body had it got into the wrong hands. That you know. That that was. We know what people over there do to 
to uh, Americans or just anyone that's not them. But um, and I know uh, Boone, I'm going to ignore you here for a minute if you don't mind, because I know that the the story of the, the, the GRS team is well documented and it's out there. You probably told the story a million times. So what I want to do is, if Sarah, if you don't mind, I think a lot of people don't understand what a CIA intelligence officer normal duties when you're in country without i know you can't talk about a lot but i think it's fascinating people think of cia and they think of you know all of these things but there's there's actual work being done not just the the covert agent guys so if if you can you know maybe not in, in in libya necessarily but throughout your career what are some of the things that people can understand about what a cia intelligence officer does on a, on a normal day-to-day basis Yeah, sure. I'm going to jump into my role as a targeter because that's what I was doing in Libya. Um, I was basically asked to come out because I had spent um, quite a few years doing capturing detain operations overseas. You know, during Gaddafi's time, we really couldn't do much, right, as a CIA or just as a government in general. So I went in um, right after the revolution. Um, I was asked to restart um, capture operations against terrorists. You know, it involved a lot of things because there was nothing in the works at the time. And so I went to country early in the year to do that, to get the operations going, to kind of track down, you know, the terrorists who lived in Libya and then also the terrorists who were flowing into Libya now that they were trying to make it a safe haven. So by um, the fall, I had traveled out to Benghazi because Benghazi is, was the key spot where most of the terrorists were based at the time. So I decided I want to go to that city, um, you know, in North Africa because it was where most of the counterterrorism was happening. So actually at the time in Benghazi, there was only two of us who were counterterrorism officers. There was one case officer and then I was the targeter. So we were a pretty small crew working against the terrorists there. Just just to jump in on that, like a a lot of people don't understand, like they see us, um, the cool guys with the cool toys, but they don't (laughs) understand the only reason we exist is because of case officers and targeters. Like we're not the mission, they are. You know, and, and the targeter is the one who actually finds fixes and then puts on the X that terrorist. So they're really the real mission. So let me ask you this, if you don't mind, Sarah, um, and, and Boone, I want to get you in here in a second. And, but with, with the CIA and all of that, like, is that something you always wanted to do growing up or like, what is the process of, of the thought of, Hey, that might be fun. I mean, how, how, how did that evolve into, I'm a CIA officer. I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, it's, it's going to be just kind of like when people make really dumb decisions in college. So, you know, I did a lot of that. I, <laughs> I didn't use and then I went to grad school. So when I went to grad school, my focus was on the Kashmir region of India and Pakistan. Okay. And the night before I went to defend my thesis, I was like, oh, my gosh, like my degree is on like Kashmir. Like, where am I getting a job? So that night, instead of preparing for my thesis, I just went online on CIA and applied. I'm like, well, I might as well try. It's the only person who's going to hire me. And they hired me. So, yeah, it was just a um, strange time. You know, they had a, obviously so much going on in um, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it was funny when I went for the interview, they're like, yeah, we're interviewing you because we never meet Kashmir experts. Um, so, yeah, it was just kind of a win-win for both of us at the time. But, yeah, I or I would have had a useless degree and been paying all my student loan debt and had some job where I would never use it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fascinating that you quite literally went to the CIA website, apply now, <laughs> and the rest is history. Um, yeah. That's crazy. Um, Boone, I'll bring you in. As far as the military side, um, had you always wanted to be in the military, or what was kind of the driving force for you to join the military as a, at a young age? Yeah, for me, absolutely. So I, I grew up during that G.I. Joe time to where it was okay to run around with BB guns and, and wear camouflage. Yeah. Um, I also came from a military and law enforcement family. So, you know, all the uncles, you know, my father, my brother, it's just what you did. So I always had that sense that, you know, hey, I need to serve. So, yeah, since I was a small child, you know, that I always saw myself in some branch of service. Right. Was was there something about the Marine Corps that drove you that direction or uh, was he happy to be the only recruiter there? Because some people say I went to the recruiting office and he was the only one there. So I went in. That literally happens to people. So uh, was there the Marine Corps something you wanted or is that just a happenstance? No, the Marine Corps is something that I actually sought out. Um, Once I was getting closer to graduating high school, 
I really started to look into the branch of the service. And I really, and again, having experience with other family members serving in every branch of the service, except the Coast Guard, um, I, I really got a lot of feedback on the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps was the last gun club. It was the only place where um, it was okay to shoot really well, be physically fit, um, you know, to be able to fight. Like those things were encouraged, but also like their, their um, sense of leadership to where, as you know, um, a Lance Corporal can do what a Sergeant can do. A Sergeant can do, you know, what a Sergeant Major can do. So that really resonated with me compared to the other branches. Yeah, for me, it literally was, I was in a dark place in my life. And I said, a buddy of mine said, hey, let's go, let's go join the military. And I was like, yeah, it sounds like as good an idea as I can right now. I was, I was going down a road that I didn't need to be going. So at least I was well enough to understand what I was going wrong. And I literally, for me, I'm ultra competitive. I'm sure you guys both are too. You don't get to where you are without being like, I'll cut your throat playing marbles if I have to. But like, I literally said, if I'm going to do this, like, let's go the hardest one. And, and I walked into the Marine Corps recruiter and I said, let's do this. And he was like, you serious? I'm like, yes. And he was like, okay. And so it was just one of those things for me. It was, if I'm going to do this, then let's do it all the way. And, and a lot of it comes down to where you're talking. Once I'm in, you start understanding um, the pride. And that's the one thing I get from a lot of my buddies that were for other branches. The one thing, they, they make fun of us. But the one thing I hear from every one of those other branches say, you know, you guys, call it what you want, arrogance, whatever, because y'all are actually proud of who you are and all of that. And I was like, you know, that, that's kind of a cool thing. And that's it's kind of instilled to us from the very beginning at boot camp is take pride in who you are. So uh, I think I carry that on. I think most of us carry that on into our normal lives is have that pride of, of, hey, you know, I might not have gone to college, but, you know, my fraternity is the Marine Corps. Who's yours? You know, and, and that's something that we always keep very, very, very close in hand. So we have obviously a lot of – a lot of jarheads that listen to this, so we always kind of do that side. But let's kind of get back to the books. I think that um, there's a lot to unfold here, and without going down timelines and all of that, I think that the we talked about this earlier is prior to this book, and you guys said it. No one has really kind of gone after, or prosecuted, or even tried to find a lot of the masterminds behind this. And and politically, I think that there's probably a reason why. Um, but I think it's interesting that when you have that many people that were involved, not just in Benghazi, but with the whole thing that those, those couple of days, you would think that there'd be a rush to find out exactly what happened. Um, in your guys' opinion, why wasn't it taken as serious or why wasn't it, it looked after? Why wasn't there a huge investigation? Was it just pure politics or what? So unfortunately, it was pure politics. What a lot of people don't understand is when they talk about Benghazi, it's become taboo and everyone wants to find the smoking gun. Um, Benghazi wasn't a conspiracy theory until they made it one. Like there was really nothing to hide until after the fact. They like, started going on talk shows. Um, when it didn't fit their narrative, that's when it became a conspiracy. But there, there was nothing to hide in Benghazi. So it was purely political. It was an election year. Um, they've already stated several times, hey, Al-Qaeda is on the run. We diminished them, and that wasn't the case. Al-Qaeda was actually thriving in Benghazi at the time. So it really didn't fit their narrative, so it was political. And unfortunately, um, the politics that come from the administration affect everybody else. It affects the intelligence community and what they focus on. Um, it affects law enforcement, like the FBI, you know, what they put an emphasis on. So it's sad, but yes, it, it is political. Now, having said that, our book's not political at all. Yeah. No, and, and I think that's that's a, that's a great thing because you, you you take that aside and say, here are facts. Here's what we saw. Here's the experiences. Like you said, a lot of most of this is all open source. We're not stating opinions necessarily. This is what it is. Form your own opinions, but here's the truth that really no one seems to be getting out. Take it or leave it, but here it is. And I think that that's maybe this is a great way to maybe I don't want to ever say close the door because people want to remember, but close the door on the conspiracy theories at least or the politics. Say here it is, guys. Uh, don't believe this side, and you know I don't want to believe this side either. Usually the gray is where the truth is, and I think that this is going to be a great one, um, Sarah. From from your vantage point, and, and Boone's already said that you guys are are the stars of. The, the the area with the CIA and all of that. Prior to September 11th and 12th of 2012, uh, 
obviously the that whole time frame with Gaddafi and all of that was kind of interesting in Libya. But was there ever any chance besides it being the anniversary? But was there ever any like chatter of this might actually happen? Well, the the one thing is when we were in Benghazi, we always said, um, you know, not if but when. We always okay. knew there'd be an attack on either us at the CIA or um, on the consulate or Americans just going out in the city because um, terrorists were already targeting Western interests there. Um, the, the Brits had left, the French had left, like people were fleeing um, Benghazi because of the number of attacks. And what a lot of people don't understand, when we were living there, the terrorists, and you'll learn this in her book, they were daily assassinating people. So like if a Libyan wanted to like, let's say join the police department or try to join the army or try to join like an intel service in um, Libya, the terrorists would come and assassinate them. If you wanted to be a judge, they'd come and assassinate them. So when we lived there, every single day people were being assassinated. There was huge assassination styles. Al Qaeda had set them up. Actually, um, one of the masterminds like, uh, you know, of our Nairobi, um, and Kenya attacks and Tanzania attacks, sorry, he was the one that actually set up the assassination cells in Benghazi. So it was oh, a wow. very dangerous place to be. We were used to crimes and terrorism every single day. And like, like Sarah was saying, there's a chapter in our book, which is raising of the black flag. Um, when the black flag was risen and was openly flown, we started to see a turn in the city. And some of those assassination squads she talks about um, these aren't your typical, you know, militias or terrorists wearing flip flops or an educated. Um, these are like special operations groups who are very well trained, combat hardened, and very well equipped. You know, like some of these guys have scar 17s, so they're they're definitely bad dudes. Yeah, and they were they were advanced in their technology. They were using the phone networks to target people, so it was an extremely dangerous to be in the city. I, I think that that's something. Um that through the whole global war on terror and maybe this is the propaganda that the that the government the u.s government uses they did it they did it during the cold war and all that but the propaganda maybe machine is they depict these people as villagers that are not educated they're they're just like you said they're walking around with ak's and i spent some time in east africa in the 90s and i can tell you one thing they're very well organized and like you said they're very well trained they're, they they communicate well. They, they are not just some people that say, "Here's here's an AK, go have fun," and, and you know all of that. I think that that's interesting. Now, when you said there were assassinations going on, I'm assuming it, we're not talking just Westerners. We're talking Libyan citizens that maybe not fit in with the Al Qaeda message. Is that what you're saying? Is anyone was up for grabs at this point? Correct. Yeah, it was mostly unfortunate Libyans being assassinated because it was the Libyans trying to join their new government and the terrorists didn't want the government to be successful. I want to talk to you guys about an organization. It's the Recon and Sniper Foundation, but I joined Team RSF, and this is the subsidiary of Recon and Sniper Foundation. Uh, they've got teams for USPSA and IDPA. Uh, they've got a team for the long range precision. They've got teams for endurance. They've got teams for skydiving. They've got teams for scuba. They've got teams for a lot of different activities, trying to get veterans more active and get out there to help promote the, the mission of the Recon and Sniper Foundation, which is to really help veterans uh, and active duty servicemen and families. Guys, I am very excited to be part of the Recon and Sniper Foundation, but I'm very honored to be part of Team RSF now. If you're involved in a lot of activities, there might be a team for you out there, a Team RSF. We want you to come in and join us. But I encourage you, I invite you guys to come join Team RSF. Did you guys spend a lot of time outside the annex or off base i mean obviously being a targeter you had to develop assets and all of that so you were probably spending time outside and, and i guess boom that's where you kind of you guys came in was you were kind of make sure that they were safe when they were doing that but how, how often would you guys leave would it be every day multiple times a day or once a week or how often would you guys with all of this craziness is going on how often would you guys leave to, to go develop your assets if you had to so w without getting to like operational details, sure, um, yes, like, yes. like Iraq where there's a green zone, you know, and a, a lot of Westerners never leave that area. Um, we were fully immersed in the local culture. So okay. we were out every day. We lived off the local economy. So um, we were just part of the backdrop. That might have probably made things easier, at least that you weren't 
uh, they, they see you every day. So you, like you said, you almost become just a second thought. Hey, these guys are here, but they're just doing their thing. So uh, that's interesting. Now, Sarah, when you were talking about being a targeter, um, without uh, what you can talk about, um, I think people will be interested to know exactly kind of what that means. And is it, are you talking about asset development and all of that interrogations? Um, I think people will be interested. How does, how does, how do you target someone to see if you can, they become an asset? Do you have specific criteria that you're looking for character traits and all that? Yeah. So if you're actually targeting them to recruit them, I mean, first thing, the most important, right? Is there a gap, right? Like, What's the US government not collecting on and can this guy meet the gap, right? And then of course, if he can meet the gap, then you look for a vulnerability, right? Like, does he have a vulnerability? Can we get at this person? You know, would he be willing? Um, you obviously don't wanna just go after people who you could never recruit, right? Um, so you might not wanna go knock in the Cuts Force guy's house down the street. Um, so, so yeah, it's finding the person, those people with access. And the funny thing is it's sometimes not the person you think it's going to be right it's someone associated with them that has just as much access so it takes a lot of creativity um it takes a lot of trial and error i think the good thing is when you work in the cia you fail a lot but it makes you be successful right because you know how to get to the end point it just sometimes takes a, a few steps um so yeah that's how what we focus on if we're actually looking for someone to recruit yeah i think that's fascinating uh I, I was an O2 in the Marines, so I, I, I was trained in, I was, I had spent a whole lot of time in the Marine Corps, but I was, I was an Intel guy. So it was, I've always, I've always kind of got a little, I, I love the fascination of the Intel side because people don't really understand. It's not what you think it is. It's always much, much harder, much, much different. Um, it's not as, as sexy as what people think. And it's, it's just, it is what it is, but uh, asset development, like you said, finding that vulnerability, um, interrogating in a way that you have to scare them yet make them trust you is always a fun time to have it, that fine line of being, getting them to talk and all that or developing them, whatever. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, when it comes down to the book, there's a lot, like you said, a lot of this is, uh, is open source stuff. And obviously your personal experiences are going to be in there. What's the one thing, this is for both of you, you guys can both answer this. What's the one thing each of you might have that you wish people knew right away? Like this is, hey, if you're finding this out 10 years later, what's the piece of information about this whole story that you should have known nine years ago? That this was an Al-Qaeda directed attack and this was Al-Qaeda, um, not just a Libyan militia. Yeah, and for me, it's, Basically, if you're going to go after terrorists, you either put them on the X or you lock them up and you never let them go. One of the issues we have is a lot of the terrorists had been captured in Libya and in other places like in Europe. They were either released, they got broken out during the revolution, or they had very short prison sentences. And that's why they're at the attack. So, you know, we're having this problem, obviously, now post Afghanistan, it's like yeah. there needs to be plans in place for long term solutions to these terrorists. If you're going to have Americans go overseas and spend a year, two years of their life to hunt down this terrorist. I don't want to see him free in two years. I'm sick of it. No, I don't even want to touch on the whole Afghanistan thing because that just, it still pisses me off to this day. Uh, you basically wasted lives in 20 years. Um, and it's not like you didn't know this was going to happen. I mean, they, they, they had to have known it. this is exactly what was going to happen. Um, so I don't even want to touch on that. Um, what I, One quick point, though, that's really yeah, interesting. Go for it. So in, in 2011, um, you know, a bunch of the terrorists broke out of prison in Libya and then they joined the revolution. About, they had 600 terrorists in prison and, and those terrorists, as we saw, you know, went on to almost take over the country. ISIS was formed there. Now, Afghanistan had 15,000 plus detainees released. Many of them, way more than 600 were terrorists. So we, we are going to see repeat oh. problems. People do need to compare 2011 Libya with, with this last year and but on a much bigger scale probably at this oh, point yeah hundred times mm. bigger very scary yeah this is this is and it's not just afghanistan it's not just libya it's not just pakistan we're talking about a region in a way of life that it sounds bad 
and I, I think the worst thing that we could do is try to fly a, an American flag in some of these places. They don't, they, they, their lifestyle doesn't, isn't conducive to what we want. I think we should maybe say, Hey, if this is something that you like, here's some teachings, here's how we, our way of life. But I think there's so many people that have grown up their whole lives being scared of, uh, and being told what to do. They almost kind of get used to that and they don't want change. And, and, and I think that, um, the vulnerability of a lot of these regions is that's why these terrorists are there because they have that fear and, and they also say, Hey, I mean, it could be worse. Um, that's, it's a scary, scary thing, but yeah, I'm, I'm really worried about what's going to happen in that region now that we don't, at least don't have a, a presence there, at least, a, at least in the presence there. Um, going through my notes here. One of the things that I did want to talk about um, with the book, and, and Sarah, I don't know how long, or, or Boone, I, I don't know how long you guys were in Libya prior to all of this, um, but were you guys there uh, when the whole Gaddafi thing went down? Because that, that seems like an interesting point of time in the history of the world because he was there forever and, and love him or hate him. The people either loved or hate him, but he was there for a long time. And the fact that he was able to be taken out was a, was a big feat that people I think don't touch on, but were you there in country or uh, around that time frame when that craziness with Gaddafi was going on? No, I came into country, I'd say about nine or 10 weeks after um, he fell. Um, and then, yeah, boom came a little later. I think of the guys of us there, I think Tig was the only one. Tig. Yeah, I think only one of us who had been there. The thing is, we rotate from many different war zones. So we yeah. actually had spent a lot of time, in, you know, in, in the South Asia region and some other places. So that was the first year we went into Libya because that was the first year they actually made it, oh. like in 2012, a war zone, right? And so they brought in our kind of um, people into it. Yeah, I think that's interesting because, you know, you, you, we talked about, the Afghanistan footprint and all of that stuff. But I don't think people realize he was in power for such a long time that you were there 10 weeks, which is only a couple months or a few months after it happened. I mean, was what was the energy was the energy level there like good or it was a vi bad vibe? I think where the people like, holy cow, we can, we don't, we're not in fear for our lives at that moment. Was that something they were proud of? Yeah, so I, I went into the Capitol and it was very positive. Um, people would interact with you and they're like, are you American? And they'd be like, yay. And that, like they, they'd celebrate and cheer. Um, it, it was it was just such a positive environment. There were things not working yet, right? Because the government was being established. And one of the funny things is trash pickup hadn't happened yet. So there's just piles of trash everywhere. I was like, where did the flag? Um, but no, the, the Libyan citizens were so happy when I was there. And they just had so much hope for their future. They didn't see this, you know, decade of terrorism to come, unfortunately. So something that's in the book, um, and it, it'll kind of help the readers understand Libya a little better. Um, so during the revolution, anyone who fought was labeled a hero or a freedom fighter. The reality is that most of those freedom fighters were actually terrorist groups. So, yeah, there was a high for a while. But then, you know, once the terrorists didn't want to re re relinquish their control, the power they had when you're trying to integrate this new government, that's when the Libyan people really started to suffer. And 9-11, 9 was a tragedy, but the real tragedy happened after the fact to the Libyan people. Correct. Yeah, I, I didn't, I, I wouldn't even thought about that, but there, there for a short time, you're saying that there are multiple different groups that probably didn't get along prior are now helping each other until we got to figure out who's going to be in charge. I, you know, there's a, there's a lot of revolution, a lot of side of revolution that, that most people are here in America will never understand because we've never been through that. Um, but I think the closest thing is, is I think we remember everything that happened here, September 12th of 2001, where we were all one flag. We were all one person. And then a couple months later, the bickering starts and it comes back to reality. So I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but I never really thought about, that side of it is the revolution they weren't all on the same side or they weren't all doing it for the same reason so that's 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 an interesting thing um yeah i never really thought about that um what i want to talk about next is and, and you discussed a little bit about um when you were asked to testify um 
for the FBI over the head honcho that wasn't the head honcho. When you guys, both of you, so when you both left Libya, I'm assuming you were debriefed somewhere else. Um, did y'all ever get straight back to the U.S. or were y'all somewhere else and then were sent other places? Like, did you ever get back to the U.S. After, right after that? No. So um, we were actually held in Germany for about a week, maybe two weeks, um, in, in secluded. Like we were kept hidden from everybody else. Yeah. And, secluded. and we didn't talk to anyone um, to include our, our families. Um, I, I barely had. Really? They wouldn't let you get home or call home? Well, I barely had communication with Sarah. Um, and they were trying to protect us from a lot of things. But at the same time, they were also suppressing us because that's mm. when political games started to happen. That's when the talk shows started to happen. And that's when the, the story started to change a little bit. So it was probably a week, week and a half before we actually made it back to the States. And then obviously once we made it back, you know, we were debriefed by everybody. Yeah. And he's downplaying this a bit. So the day of the attacks, I flew up to Europe. Um, I held meetings, obviously the attack occurred. So I had to fly back to Libya. I was only leaving town to go to one meeting. So I came back into Tripoli and I stayed there to the end of November. But I don't think I talked to any of them for a week. Like I could not physically chat or talk on the phone for it with them for an entire week, which is crazy, right? Because I couldn't collect any info from them on what happened. Um, yeah, so it, it was actually like insane. If you, if you can imagine, like you can't talk to your own friends and coworkers. Um, it, well, it was pretty bad. The whole thing is interesting because all this craziness is going on over this day and a half or whatever, uh, 12 hours, 13 hours, this 13 hour ordeal. But it's not like y'all are y'all were always in communication. You had 27 different things that everyone was trying to do to survive. And the fact that you can't debrief yourself is, is crazy. That just shows that the machine at, at its finest. Um when you guys were able to finally like talk and all that, whatever weeks, months later, you know, I know this is always something everyone that was there is going to have kind of collectively. That's part of who you are and what you're doing now today. But does it ever, if you didn't have the book, I mean, does it, is it something that comes up in your mind? I mean, how often do you rehash or relive or think about, like, I can't believe we made it out of that or whatever. Does that ever happen? Or you just kind of try to put that and compartmentalize that out of your mind? No, actually, for me personally, and, and this isn't like tough guy talk. It's just the reality. Yeah, of, yeah. Um, like, we've been doing it for so long. We've had so many other incidents. This is just one that was made public. Um, as soon as I made it back, as soon as I was debriefed, I'm like, Hey, when can I get back out there? You know? And they're like, Hey, take some time off. I'm like, no, I'm ready to go back. So, um, I actually redeployed right away. So okay. uh, no, it, and again, it's not tough guy talk. It was just another day, another incident. It's compartmental. It's, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a job. It's just yeah. do this. Yeah. It's kind of 100%. better to get back on that horse anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But, but he also says this, and it's really interesting, when he finally got back to the States, whatever it was, eight or nine days later, you know, he had to go in D.C., and then the next day was going into headquarters. And so I said, just stay at my house. And he ends up calling me at like 10 or 11 at night. And he says, hey, where can I get some clothes? And I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, there's blood on my pants and my shoes. I'm like, they didn't give you, like, you don't have clothes? I'm like, you're going to have to go to Walmart. And, and did you? I think he had to go to Walmart and buy clothes so he could wear them to CIA the next day. I mean, so not only they were sequestered, they like weren't really taken care of very well either. So yeah, it was, they were treated horribly. Were you, honest, were you still wearing the clothes from that night when you came back? Yes. Yeah. When we were That's in Germany, crazy. we were afforded the opportunity to get like a, um, a USO track suit. I think there's like a picture of us all in USO track suits. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you took that off immediately, didn't you? <laughs> hey, let's get our photo up and uh, I'm good. <laughs> good. That's crazy. Um, <laughs> I don't even think about that. When you're talking about going right back into the job and, and, and Sarah, the same way, you probably, I mean, you said you went right back into Tripoli and you didn't go to Benghazi necessarily, but you were right back in country. When you got there to your next post, this is for Dave and Sarah, 
people I'm assuming kind of knew who you were at that point because they probably heard about what was going on in your own little factions of the CIA or whatever. Did they treat you differently? Do they treat you well or badly? Or, I mean, you were obviously someone that was, had been through something that was very publicized. Were you treated any differently, good or bad at your next post? Yeah, I'll start first. Okay. I was treated horribly. Um, so first off, the people in Tripoli didn't want the Benghazi people from CIA there. Um, another thing is, is they tried getting me in trouble because there was a gun in my safe and money in my safe. And they tried to like go after me for it. And I said, no, it's like in the safe in my bedroom, Benghazi. And finally, a month later, when FBI went, I had a GRS guy go and like bring my entire safe back because they gave me such a hard time. CIA sent me to collections. So when I left Tripoli, I was supposed to spend a night in Malta and then go to, I mean, sorry, when I left Europe, I was supposed to spend a night in Malta and then go back to Benghazi. Obviously Benghazi was closed, so I flew straight into Tripoli. Well, I guess I got charged that night in that hotel or something. So yeah, CIA sent me to a collections agency. Um, oh, and then when I came back from Europe, I only had two outfits. Um, the basically the support person in Tripoli wouldn't help me get any clothes. So I wore the same two outfits for about three weeks until a friend of ours actually packed up clothes for me and had someone bring them from the United States, even though there are stores in Libya where I could buy clothes. So yeah, I, it was pretty horrible. Wow. How long, I, I know that you, and we're, we're getting ready to get into this transition here. Um, I know you left the CIA. Well, you both did, but Sarah, you left the CIA, did some civilian work, and you're now back in uh, in a different organization. Um, how quickly after that did you decide that, hey, maybe the CIA isn't like, was it a, a year, two years? How long after that were, you were, were you still with the CIA? I actually stayed in the CIA. I went and started working in a different area. I started working um, against um, like the Iranian Quds Force. So I stayed until I was actually recruited out. So Trey Gowdy recruited okay. me out to go. So I left in um, January 2015. Okay. So and you're that, there a few more years. Okay. Yeah, and that was to the select committee. Um, I actually stayed there till 2016. Okay. Did you really? Okay. And so – did you stay in the Northern Africa region? I know you might not be able to say, but where, was that where you kind of wanted to be? Or is that where you, you, they were had you like, did, could you choose, Hey, I would like to go somewhere else. Or is that, that the area you kind of stayed in? I would have loved to be like in like Rome or something, but no, sure. uh, they always <laughs> have to cast places. So no. Yeah. We never went back for work to North Africa. So that was basically. okay. Okay. So that was the last time you were there. Y'all have no reason to go back now, do you, Ever? Do you have any desire to go back at all? Yeah, we have some yes. guys we want to put on the X, um, and we will have Oh, okay, well, okay, for that reason, okay, yes, I get that. But uh, to, for no, the – Call us. Call us. <laughs> call us. <laughs> yeah, I get that side of it. I was thinking more of uh, do you have any desire to go back there just to, for reminiscence? But, uh, no, you have, you have different reasons that you want to get back. I love that. Yeah, that X has got, got your name on it there, bud. This is a quick reminder to all of our brothers and sisters out there that are in that hole, in that darkness, trying to find that light. Call me, text me, email me 24-7. I can't give you medical advice, but I could probably be a pretty good ear to listen to anything, maybe help you talk you through some stuff. If you are looking for some medical advice and medical attention, remember two things. One, you are not alone in this fight. You have a lot of brothers out here that are willing and able to help you in any way. And two, the world is a much better place with you in it. So please utilize the Veteran Crisis Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. Once again, 1-800-273-8255. Or you can simply dial 988 on your cell phone. Do not let the darkness overcome you. There is light. Fight through. We're here to help. So we're going to talk a little bit now, and we talked about this earlier, um, about transitioning. Um, there's a lot of a lot of our heroes and, and warriors out there that um, they're getting ready to get out or they have gotten out and they're having issues. This is one of the things that I get contacted with a lot in some of the work that I do with other organizations about what's my next step. And it's, it's fascinating that a lot of people that work for the government don't get the training or the uh, information of what's next. And so I, I get a lot of stuff and all that. And, and, and Dave, 
Um, you transitioned from the military into contract work and contract work back into straight civilian life and all of that. And Sarah, you've gone from uh, government work to civilian back into, you know, different government work. For those that are out there, and not just military people, but someone who might be in that the middle of their life and saying, is this really what I want to do and all of that? But especially for the people that might be getting out, whether it's with a, an organization or military or whatever, what are some of the things that you could sit there and, and help and say, look, I wish I would have known this then. Is there is there one or two things that you could give some advice for some of our, our guys and gals that are, are, are thinking about or getting ready to get out and, and don't know what to do with their lives? Definitely. I think both of us um, can, can give good advice. But um, for me personally, if you're still actively serving in the military, um, start to prepare at least a year out. Don't wait till last minute to try to get things in order. Um, definitely focus on your education. Um, it's it, it not knocking college. You know, you can go to college and not learn anything, but it is something that's almost like a requirement today. If you don't have at least a four year degree, you're not going to be looked at the same. You're not going to be as competitive. Now, having said that, the skills you get from the military are extremely valuable. Valuable, the life experience, um, the leadership skills, the management ability are extremely valuable. So, um, write down what you actually do, and then translate that into um, civilian language. You know, without all the acronyms, and I'm bad at that. I still use acronyms. I am too. I am too. Um, but translate it into civilian language and then leverage that. You know, the fact that you were in the military and some of the things that you did, to us, it's like, oh, yeah, that's no big deal. But in the civilian sector, it is a big deal, and you bring skills that just aren't available. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when I when I actually mentor people who – it's mostly on their resumes, right? It, it is getting it, it tweaked correctly um, to go to the private sector. In the government, we do things that, like – people don't do in the private sector, right? It's like, oh yeah, I ran counterterrorism operations. I met with the prime minister. I went over the MOD, the head of the, you know, the MOD, anytime I felt like it. Like, it, it's just like people in the private sector have no idea our skills and we do have to yeah. learn how to sell them better because c companies want us. So the one thing I've learned a lot from talking to different companies and they'd be like, hey, why, I always ask, why do you hire CIA? Um, and they say, we hire CIA because we can get the smartest people all over the world to come in here. But CIA people, they're closers. I will yeah. give them something and they'll go get it done. And they won't ask me a million questions. They'll say, yep, get it done. I'll knock it out. And they'll figure out a way to do it. And that is a skill that you know you get from working overseas. You get for the frustration of working with foreigners and everything falling apart or them not keeping any timelines. So yeah, you, you really need to point out that you can handle those things. I mean, a big thing, like he said, management, um, obviously military goes great into that project management. There's just a lot of um, areas that have a lot of money behind the jobs um, that the tech field loves people in our industry, especially because they want to plug in a bit to national security. Like they might not want to make it the focus of their business, but they want to tie back to the government. They want to have that little piece where they're doing something for their country and, and we can fit into that role. You know, I, I think it's interesting. And like I said, I, I talk to people all the time and I'll say, and, and you kind of say the same thing is, is, it's nice to have that degree. It, it, it kind of proves that you can spend four or five years of your life in past classes. It, it means you can accomplish a goal. I tell people all the time, I said, look, if, if you feel that in the, the line of work that you want to do, a, a college degree is pretty much required, then go knock it out. Like, go knock it out. You know, you're going to have some benefits that are going to help you do that. Go knock it out. I said, something else I said, but your diploma is your DD-214. That proves that you spent the same four, five, eight, 12, 16, 20 years saying that I can complete a mission too. And oh, by the way, I, I have incredible time management skills. I do not crack under pressure. I know how to follow because you can't be a leader until you learn how to follow. So you know how to follow, you know how to lead. I said, these are skills that translate to any job any corporation anywhere in the world these are skills that i said i would much rather have a 22 year old person that spent four years in the marine corps or army navy or wherever in the military than a 22 year old that just spent being preached at 
by some professors and some weird stuff. I said a 22 year old straight out of college or a 22 year old that spent four years in the military, you have life lessons. You have experiences that those people probably have never left the country and you've got to do a lot of stuff that no one will ever get to do. I said, there's a value yourself, value your voice, value your skill sets, value everything that you have. I said, because the second you start thinking that they're better than you, I said, they've already beat you. I said, you're not like that. I told you all the time. You're, you wouldn't have spent, you wouldn't have gone and raised your right hand and taken that oath if you weren't that person. I think a lot of it has to do with the believing yourselves. Uh, those are great points. I, I want to give you a few minutes before we start talking about where we can find the book and all of that stuff. I, I am not always the greatest person to ask questions that I should ask. So I always want to give you guys, is there something about the book or whatever that I haven't touched on that uh, you want to make sure that the public gets out before this podcast ends? We don't have enough time. We can go as long as you need. <laughs> <laughs> We're here, I'm here as long as you guys want to be here. I, I've had three hour podcasts before. Uh, no, as long as you guys want to talk, we can talk. But I want to make sure that um, you guys are getting the ample time. So we, we need to go long. We can go long. Whatever you guys want to do, it's up to you. But if there's stuff that y'all need or want to make sure people understand, man, take the floor and roll with it. Well, I'm, I'll let uh, Sarah answer that. But just from my perspective, there's a lot of information in the book. Um, it, it's timely. It's something that they definitely, the American people should want to know this information. Um, the FBI doesn't have this information. The CIA doesn't have some of this information. So it is extremely important that we get the word out. People actually read the book, educate themselves. Um, in my opinion, there's two books on Benghazi that are actually credible, 13 Hours and then Under Fire. The reason being both those books were written by guys on the ground from the annex team or guys on the ground from the State Department team. The problem with those books, it's a very narrow perspective about their experience, not the totality of the circumstances. So this book actually answers the questions that everybody had. Who did it? Why they do it? Where are they now? Right. And the really the key part is right i mean it's an open source investigation because we went and collected ourselves but we're two cia officers who went out and collected ourselves so like boone says we got better information than the cia right because we spent seven years on this um you know it was our life um we self-funded it so people are gonna see a lot of effort in it i'm a targeter you're going to be able to network analysis off our book like for the next decade. That's how good um, we Love put the that. things in and the linking. So yeah, mm -hmm. our book actually identifies over a hundred of the terrorists. And we're not saying identifies, we have their photo, we have their true wow. name, we have their current status, we have every terrorist group they're ever involved in. So if they fought in Iraq, it's in the book. If they fought in Afghanistan, it's in the book. If they fought in Algeria, it's in the book. If they fought later on in Syria, it's in the book. So this is like if you are like a geek on terrorism, um, this is like the book for you. And it's also really a good book. You know, if your kids are thinking of getting into this field, a lot of especially women don't think of getting into targeting and analysis. You know, like if you have a high school student, you know, show them this. You know, it, it, it's going to take say, hey, this is what you can do. This is what people do out there. Um, I think it's going to be a really great at university. So we, we kind of wrote it to help kind of train the next generation as well. Yeah, and that, that, that's awesome because, I, like I said, I think that the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people only know what they've seen on TVs or the movie screen and and heard what the machine has wanted them to hear. And that's when I saw, I saw start seeing this a few weeks ago uh, is when I reached out to you, but I started seeing this book. I was like, this is interesting because this, is, this isn't the story. This is, this is it. Like, this is really what it is. And for those people out there that really want to know, even the conspiracy theorists would enjoy this because at this point, it's not a conspiracy theory anymore. This is really what it was. And so it's interesting. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to uh, getting it and in, in all of that. But I want to, I, I really thank you guys for coming on. Um, before we get out of here, uh, let's talk a little bit about maybe what you guys are doing today. That um, you know, I know you're Sarah. You're working um, with another 
uh, department there. And Boone, you've got a lot of stuff going on, but can I talk about what you're going on today? And, and, and if you want to, you can if, and all that. But I know, Dave, you, you're doing some different things for, uh, in the public eye and with training and all of that. So if you want to can maybe promote that a little bit, and then we'll talk about the book and all of that. But I want to give you guys a few minutes to talk about what you guys are doing today and, and promote whatever you need to promote in that realm. So absolutely. Um, Sarah's actually doing way more than I am. Uh, <laughs> I, I am training full time. So I spend a lot of the time on the road training all over the country. Um, firearms manipulations, fundamentals and marksmanship. And then the more advanced, I, I hate that word advanced, but the more advanced tactical stuff, um, CQB, active shooter defense, primarily law enforcement, but we do a lot of open enrollment as well. Um, if okay. you're interested in that, our company's threatening. I am. <laughs> I want to come. <laughs> uh, I love doing CQB stuff. That's one of my favorite things to go train with. I love so it. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Come on out. We'd love to have you. <laughs> so it's uh, Threat Management Solutions or Scari Tactical, and you can find us at shootingclasses.com. And that pairs in comparison of all the stuff that she's doing. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's a quick overview. Um, no, we make a joke. I have a thousand jobs, but I don't get paid for anyone except the one from the government. And right, um, right. That's not my most my hardest job. Um, so yeah, basically for the last year, I've been doing evacuations from Afghanistan. That's a huge focus. Um, and really. Then, yeah, and I'm also doing. That's evacuations awesome, by the way. Thank, thank you for doing that. I know there's a lot of guys and gals over there that are glad there are people like you over there. Yeah. I, I mean, what I always tell, like I have, I luckily have a person donating the money to do my operations. And what I always tell that person is they just don't, all we need to do is not forget them, right? We got to give them that hope. We got to give them that time. And as long as we can give them those items, they'll get to a finish line. Um, you know, I'm not focused just on the U.S. I've gotten my um, Afghans to a variety of countries, um, India, Canada, United Kingdom, France. So, you know, it's wherever I can get them out, I'll get them. And then I'm also running a, um, like a NGO coordination network in Ukraine. And we've been doing that since February. And we've done evacuations, obviously feeding people, a lot of different humanitarian things, getting supplies to hospitals. So yeah, um, just, just this whole last year, just been really involved in the humanitarian front. And it's a ton of veterans involved, a lot of former Marines. And we have a really great community. But you know, like you said, you, you, you talk about this veteran crisis hotline, you know, mm -hmm. especially um, the Afghanistan bit where, you know, we're having a lot of people with moral injuries. We're having a lot of um, relationship problems because, you know, people are spending a lot of time trying to save Afghans or they're just feeling guilty that they maybe couldn't save someone they wanted to. And it is really affecting our veteran population. And I, and I, yeah. I do worry this could be, we could have long-term effects if we don't focus on the Americans impacted by this. You know, and, and survivor guilt is a thing. A lot of people don't understand survivor guilt. It is a thing. Um, whether or not people want to face that or not, and that, that, that want to admit that survivor guilt, it, it is a thing. And, and it, it might not be survivor guilt in the sense of I'm the only one that of my, my team that lived, but I was able to get out of the Ukraine. I was able to get out of Afghanistan and some of my buddies are, are still over there or assets, you know, in your job, assets are, are, are key. And I, I can't imagine having assets but being someone in in the agency or something that was in afghanistan for 10 years and you leave and your assets are left high and dry because there's no telling what happens to those people um there's a lot of that stuff going on so i i think that's awesome have, have you have you been to the ukraine i mean have you ever been over there or are you working from over here yeah i'm working solely from over here we we have many of our volunteers that have been on the ground um yeah Ukraine, a lot of them, obviously, early on, especially for the evacuations, a lot of Americans were supporting the evacuations and getting, um, you know, the Ukrainians that needed help out and then helping get to the Americans. You know, one of the issues was, as some of the Americans were trapped in the areas the Russians went into cr quickly. So we actually had oh, to yeah. deal with Americans in those more difficult areas. So you needed people with my background to do targeting, to do route planning. Mm -hmm. You know to, to safely get them out because um you know our government wasn't doing it our state department was actually saying go contact these volunteer groups like we're not going to be the ones to rescue you so yeah there can't be an american footprint at least a governmental footprint because that starts a whole new shebang um i know that there were guys and, and just there was there was a lot of them but i know like a tim kennedy when the whole afghanistan thing like 
he got on some like guy's jet and took a crew and said, look, we're going and we're going to get some people out. And it's awesome to know that there are people that sit there and say, look, right is right and wrong is wrong. Um, so thank you for continuing to get that because how with is there an official number? I don't know. But I mean, there are still Americans over in Afghanistan, are there not? Yeah, actually, when we left Kabul, there were still 8,000 Americans and there were 14,000 green card holders. So we left over 20,000 people basically standing outside the gates who had homes in America. Um, you know, when you bring up Tim Kennedy, he's in actually um, a federation I belong to. It's called the Moral Compass okay. Federation. His group is. They actually did this really amazing documentary all Americans should watch. Um, it's free on Amazon Prime called Send Me. Please watch I'm it. I'm going to watch it tonight. I will. I, I didn't know it was on there. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, it's really important for people to actually understand just what happened in Afghanistan. Yeah, it's 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 well, like I said, that, that that's a whole disaster in itself. But uh, it's nice to know that there are people that are still um, with the way society is. The next squirrel moment, they they move on to the next thing and all of that, and they don't realize that there's twenty thousand. I mean, it may not be as many now, um, but at one point, there were 20,000 people over there, which means there's 20,000 families and friend groups that didn't have answers. I'm sure they weren't getting answers from the government, and they didn't have any idea when they were, or if they were coming home. So thank you for doing that. That's, that's an awesome thing. Um, we got a few more minutes. I don't want to keep you too long on a Friday night. Uh, we can stay as long as you want, though. But um, I want to give you time to talk about uh, the book, where they can find it, um, when the book tour starts, like when are you going to go around on the book tour and all of that? Um, but talk about where they can find it um, and, and anything else. Like I said, anything in closing that you want to touch on that we haven't talked about, the floor is yours. Yeah, sure. So we're not going to have your standard book tour because we actually self-publish for, for a multitude of reasons. Mostly we didn't want anyone influencing um, politically our book. Excellent. So, we are likely, if you go to his schedule on shootingclasses.com when it comes out for this next fiscal year, we will probably do book signings in all the cities he teaches because it'll be easiest for traveling. Um, we live in Florida. We're going to have book signings in mid-November um, in Tampa, in Orlando. For um, sales, basically, we're, for the hardcover, we're mostly trying to tell everyone, use Barnes & Noble. Um, Amazon is price gouging our book, and they're shipping from basically a third-party shipper. So you're going to pay a double the price for no reason, and you're going to get the book way farther than you need to from now. But you can get a Kindle on Amazon um, with no problems, and then you can also get the Nook ebook too. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll also have them on our Star Media website as well, and those will probably be signed also. And so, guys, I want to have in the description below, I'm going to have links to all their websites and all that stuff. So all you got to do is look in the description below and, and click on the links, and it'll at least get you to where you guys can go uh, to support what they're trying to do, support the book, uh, and maybe see um, Boone's class schedules if you want to, Shake his hand, get his autograph, a book signing, and also maybe get some uh, firearms instruction. That would be the way to do it. But, um, yeah, thank you guys so much. I, I really have enjoyed this talk because this is this, this is the Benghazi talk that no one's heard before. This is the one that everyone knows certain bits or what they want you to know. And it's nice to know that you guys spent seven years. And just That's amazing to me, seven years on this um, are you glad that it's over? Do you miss doing the research? I mean, is, is there part of that post-mortem almost? It's not over. This is an active, open investigation. Yeah, we nice. still have about 20 to 30 to 30 more people to finish the, their bios or to get a piece we're missing. So so there was over 150 attackers um, on the scene, and we want to get as many of them as possible. We obviously know some of them we won't get unless a government goes, captures the guy, and debriefs them, um, since we can't do that legally. <laughs> we have considered it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we are still going the strong. The keyword there is legally. The keyword there is legally. <laughs> but yeah. they don't know it won't hurt them, right? <laughs> if legally can do it and take us with us, we're, we're in it. And that's a really big thing, you know, as, 
as we say, this is an open investigation, but if our own government doesn't go after those people, we want to support other governments. It's one of the reasons we made it unclassified. So like if you're in France, if you're in Algeria, if you're in Mali and you have Libyans in prison, we can give you photo lineups. You know, we will give you information to go collect information on our attackers. We are more than happy. We can um, put together info to do watch lists. Remember, none of these terrorists have been watch listed. So we need the EU to watch list them. We need to have some of those key hubs like the Emirates to watch list them because any of them can go get a visa and come to the United States right now. It's pretty dangerous, pretty scary. So if, if there is someone out there that would like to help in the investigation or whatever, is there a way they can reach you guys, get a hold and say, hey, I want to join the fight here? Yeah, we actually right inside the cover of the book, we, we put like a Proton Mail account. It's just gauzy tips, but you'll see it right inside the cover. You can always obviously reach us um, Proton or something. I mean, reach us on um, like LinkedIn or Instagram. Um, right. We'll take any tips. We'll run down, um, you know, any information available. I, I, I mean, there's so many things. I don't want to keep you guys. There are so many questions that I have. Um, I'd love to guys get you back on maybe, but if I can ask one more question before we get out of here, uh, like I said, I know it's a Friday night. You guys have other places you want to be by hand, sides hanging out in a podcast, but you talk about there's 150 people that you, you're you trying to investigate, at least, at least this 150 people. How, I know that you guys have both been trained in different aspects that will help in that investigation, whether it's interrogation or whatever, but how do you, how are you able to identify the 150 so people? Is it through uh, surveillance cameras or through word of mouth? I mean, how are you able to come up with this list of people that were there? I mean, it all can't be from personal memories. Right. Oh, I'll go first. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Obviously, we did those basic things like web scraping and social media scrapes. But again, that doesn't so much is wrong on Twitter and Facebook, even though a ton of our terrorists have Facebook accounts. So I hope Elon really? will Facebook next. But anyway, um, no, wow. Boone alluded to this earlier. Obviously, we won't get into our sources and methods too much. But hmm. remember, for the last... No, 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 no. Yeah, for the last 10 years, these terrorists have been killing Libyans. They've been they've killed in some families all the males of an entire family. So we... They're in their line, in the bloodline, basically. Yeah, like the only one left is maybe the mom and a sister. So we basically use the Libyans. We use the Libyans because they have been the biggest victims of these terrorists. And um, that's who we thank for our content. So our content is derived from Libya. Obviously, we didn't get anything in the U.S. Um, and it's because we have the same enemy. No, absolutely. And I'm sure they're, they're, will, they're willing to talk as much as they can because they hate them just as much as you guys do, pretty much. Well, one thing about our investigation, though, um, like it can't be disputed. So it's not theory. Like when we identify people, um, we use identifiers to make sure that they were time and place predictable. We either have a picture and a date and time stamp of them at the annex or at the consulate. So it's irrefutable. It's not what we think. It's like we know. Now, there are others that we haven't proven yet that we have a pretty good idea. So anyone you see in a book, it's a fact they were there, you know, and we have a picture of them and or we have a picture of their body and we can prove that they were there. That's awesome. Um, man, the, the database, I could only imagine the database and the, the spreadsheets and everything else that you guys have working. I, I, I just I can't imagine the amount of information, uh, the, the spider web that it takes to be able to put this together. Um, it's harder than people think. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's got to be incredibly difficult. Uh, by the time identifying to proving that whole, if you find X, Y, Z, if it's John Smith, I know that's a bad example of a name over there, but if you, if you have John Smith, from the time that this name pops up, on average, how long has it taken you guys to verify 100% yep, that was one of them? Is, is it a month, a week, or does it just depend on information sources? Yeah, we didn't really do it. I, I get the way you're saying it, but how we started the investigation, we actually decided 
first we wanted to prove it was Al Qaeda. So we actually okay. first okay. focused on finding the Al Qaeda attackers. We actually started with a small number. We wanted to find 50 and then we wanted to find 80. And then we, when we got 80, we we're like, screw it, we're going to find them all. Uh, yeah. So, so, so it obviously ebbed and flowed, but the one thing actually that took most time once we confirmed them, we wanted to, because we want to share the investigation and get people to go after them. The hardest part was the current statuses, because we want to tell you in the book if they're at large, if they're oh, missing, yeah, sure. if they're deceased, because why have you look at someone who's deceased? So actually finding out that they were killed, getting their postmortem photos, because we wanted to not just say he died. We want to actually have a picture. Here compare yep. it and say, yes, okay, this person did die. That was actually um, kind of a, a little bit of a hurdle for us. i got to have you guys back on another time. I mean, there's so many things we can talk about. Uh, but i tell you what I want to do first is I want to read the book and then I maybe have you guys back on because it might be a better conversation at, at this point. Like I said, uh, it's – is the book out currently or is it getting ready to come out? Uh, I, I know that at one point I saw something mid-November, but then I've also seen it out already. So is yeah. it pre-ordered now or is it actually out right now? It's out, but because we self-publish, it's like print to order. So when you make okay, your order, I got you. they print it okay. and they send it to you. That's why Barnes & Noble is the quickest. They're turning it around in about four to five business days, depending on where you okay. live in the United States. So you're, you're going to get it pretty quick. Nice. Definitely. I, I definitely would love to have you all back, but I, I think that I'd probably do it more justice after reading the book and all of that and have you guys come back on if, you, if you're willing to, because there's so many things I want to, there's so many things I want to dive into. Um, but thank you so much for both of you. First of all, both of you, thank you for your service uh, to our country. Thank you for uh, keeping this going. There are people like me that are not conspiracy theorists, but are enthralled um, with finding out certain timelines and certain things in our history and events to finding out the truth. And um, this is one of them. And I, I really do appreciate it. I, I wish you all the best of luck with this book. I'm going to try to get it out there. Guys, Christmas is coming up around the corner. This would be a wonderful Christmas gift. Um, I'm gonna put a, I'll put a link on my website through my store as well, the link it through Barnes & Noble and all of that. Um, get out there, share this. Uh, share this podcast with as many people as you can, guys, and, and try to get as many books out there because this is the truth. This is the, I mean, this is not the 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 version the government wants you to hear. This is the unclassified, the real deal. So, uh, Boone, Sarah, thank you. Uh, it's, it's an honor to meet you guys. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, like I said, I'd love to have you come back, but um, any parting words, uh, feel free to let them go now. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm going to help us take it to the enemy. I'm definitely going to do that, and uh, we'll help you guys as much as we can and get some of these guys on the X for you, like you said. So yeah. thank you guys so much for watching and listening in podcast form. Uh, you've been watching and listening to the Jarhead Podcast. We'll see you soon. Simper Fi. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to check out all of our other podcasts from Season 1, our swag store, any of our videos, go check out our website, ghosttactical.us. Once again, thank you for listening and always supporting all of our ventures. We truly do appreciate you guys. We'll see you soon. Simplify.